I'm Paul McDade, an editor, assistant editor, occasional actor working in the TV and film industry in Los Angeles, and this is my sister. I'm Liz McDade, a huge Columbo fan and a small business owner living in Santa Cruz, California. And this is Trenchcoat Cigar Peugeot, Wandering with Columbo. In each episode, we'll bring you a little Hollywood history, glamour, and behind the scenes as we walk you through Columbo, one of America's greatest TV detective series. And today we are digging into season four, episode one, Exercise in Fatality. This aired originally on September 15th. 1974, so almost almost the 50-year uh, anniversary for this one, Paul. Next mm-hmm. year, I guess we're a year off, but we're recording it 49, we're recording this about 49 years after its original air date. Wow. That's kind of crazy. Our snack today is an egg salad sandwich with the option of vitamins, if you prefer, and our drink is wine with a non-alcoholic option of carrot juice. But there were so many great snacks and drinks in this episode, so I feel like listeners should feel free to enjoy just about anything with this one. What were the other snacks? Well, there's a cracker. There's, (laughs) um, oh, now you're putting me on the spot, Paul. That's right. That's right. Um, Come on. Well, there's um, all of that awesome Chinese food that gets mentioned. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the vitamins, vitamins, right? The, the supplements. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a ton of different juices and there's like a Bloody Mary. I don't know. There's a lot of good um, food and drink scenes that we'll get into. Well, what do you have? All right. So I made a vegan egg salad sandwich. So as you know, my girls and Elliot are vegan. I do eat eggs and cheese. But today I made us all a vegan egg salad sandwich. It's actually really yummy. It's chopped up tofu with um, vegan mayo, mustard, a little onion, and some seasoning on toasted challah bread from our local bakery, Gail's Bakery down the road, with a little green lettuce, and it is delicious. I'm going to take a bite right now. Mm. <laughs> All right, Paul. What do you have? I have I have a I have a sandwich that's almost eaten with mayonnaise. Nice. Um gluten-free bread and lettuce and tomato and that's that's all I was going to uh That's okay. That was about it. Hey man. <laughs> and and wine. You said wine. You I got wine. You got a sandwich. I got that's a glass great. of a red wine. What's this? What's uh, tell us about your wine, Paul? Yeah. Uh my wife Got it, St. John. It's a uh, La Sondriente 2021 uh, Spanish red wine. Yeah. So it's like a blend, I guess. Very nice. Um, yeah, I've, I think, yeah, we've had this before. I love the, the, the drawing in the front. I can't quite see the drawing in the front. I, I oh, there we go. Oh, that's cool. We'll have pictures, um, dear listener, of our snacks and drinks on our Instagram account. What was your drink, did you say? So I'm having a rosé. It's French. Um, it has a rooster and a chicken on the label. And I can't, I know I'm going to totally mess up the pronunciation. It's La Vie Ferme. Um, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice rosé. I get this one fairly often. It's super affordable and tasty. And it goes great with my vegan egg salad sandwich. So mm. I, I feel just like. Uh, just like the character in the movie who enjoys this exact same thing, which we will get to. <laughs> yeah, the carrot juice I thought about, it, I was like, oh, I don't know. It may, may not work well with me today. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to get like a real small serving of that because I feel like you can't drink a lot of carrot juice. It's just a little, or I don't know, maybe you can. Maybe we need to broaden our horizons, Paul. Yeah. Well, you know who was born yesterday, right? Who? Peter Fox. <gasps> Oh my goodness! Happy birthday, Peter! Yep, Fox. Saint John. Saint John told me. She said, "You guys are doing that, right?" And I was like, "Oh, uh, I didn't know that." <laughs> so you're gonna sing "Happy Birthday," right, Paul? You're gonna sing for us? Maybe. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> that Feliz. is not Happy Birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How All much right, wine Liz. did you have yeah, before we hit record, Paul? This is 
the first okay. first first of of the day of many to come. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm just teasing you. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. So we have our snack, we have our drink, and then um, we have smoke signals today where we read letters from listeners or share some other interesting reflections on the beloved Columbo. And Paul, you have something for us today. I'll have, I'll, sh- I'll make a picture of this, but look what I have. Hang on. Hey, Paul is holding up a tote bag that I got him a while ago. I found this yep. on Etsy. Um, it's not in our shop on Redbubble. It's in someone else's shop. And it says Milo Janus Health Spa Chatsworth. Milo Janus is where <laughs> it's at. <laughs> that was the, this, this one was kind of a big budget one. You think, I think so? This episode. Yeah. Uh, so here, because they had to come up with the jingle, right? That's, That's true. Not cheap. And it's a great jingle. Um, yeah. So here, here I'm going to, this is a book called Stolen Glimpses, Captive Shadows by Jeffrey O'Brien. He is a poet. Um, he's a critic, cultural historian. His books include The Fall of the House of Walworth, Sonata for Jukebox, The Phantom Empire, and six poetry collections. Mm. And he is editor-in-chief of the Library of America and a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He lives in Brooklyn when this was published. He has an essay in here that I just randomly got this. Not randomly, but because he's he, it, this one's called uh, Writing on Film 2002-2012. So it's essays. And they're really good, but he had one on Columbo. Oh, yay. Called uh, A Memory of Columbo. And it's a really good article, and I'll I'll read it uh, little little slivers of it. Um, he says watching TV in the early seventies was supposed to be something easy. You forgot what you were watching, even while you watched. In the midst of all that, Columbo emerged with its un- with its unshakable clarity. The planning and executing of the perfect crime. This crime occurred somewhere in a deliciously fake version of a Southern California inhabited, um, you know what? I better read from the book because my handwriting is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, so you bad, still don't Paul. wear reading glasses? I need to get some. I need to get some. Well, because you're, doing, you're um, doing it without them. I'm very impressed. No, no, that, that's for driving. I'm driving at night. So here we go. This crime occurred somewhere in a de- deliciously fake version of a Southern California inhabited almost exclusively by wealthy white people. Um, this was a pastoral paradise of wealth masquerading as happiness. On the one hand, there was that seductive hotel suite world of luxurious fakery with the preeming egotist at its core. And on the other, there was Peter Falk dropped as if from another planet. Mm, Yes. How profound was this Columbo? We couldn't get over it. He had all the earmarks of the hidden teacher the secret messenger. He was like the so- he was like the Socrates of the symposium. And uh, hold on, Liz. Yeah, he was he was the power of passivity exemplified in the Taoist notion about water, the softest and most yielding of elements, wearing away rock. There was decidedly something East Asian about the guy. He was one of those ragged wandering monks who never spoke to the point, conveyed everything by indirection. Harmless until you tried to get a hold on him. He made himself available as an object of contempt, and his opponent could never resist the invitation. By withdrawing utterly into himself, withholding all anger, all direct attack, he opened an abyss into which his opponent fell. Anyway, it's just, it's a really excellent I like essay. that. He's like water to a rock. Yeah. He's like a monk. I like that. Mm-hmm. No, this writer is really good. I, I was just going to say, it's interesting that this writer mentions that Columbo never shows anger because he does in this episode. Yeah, I mean, he he makes statements like that, like uh, the, the perfect crime. A lot of times it's a crime in haste, you yes. know, so there, there's a lot of things that are just sort of generalized. Um, but you get you get his his wonderful reminiscing, you know, you know why he's 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 talking about it. Yeah, I like that. I like his way of noticing. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Paul. We'll put the. Um, sure name of the author and that book in our show notes so if anybody wants to go out there and read 
What's the author's name again, Paul? Jeffrey O'Brien. Jeffrey O'Brien's essay on Columbo. Have to check that out. Cool. All right. So we are going to jump into this episode now with a summary to begin. And here it is. Milo Janis, the owner of a gym brand, murders one of his franchise owners who's threatened to expose Milo's shady accounting. Milo tries to make it look like a workout-related accident, but Columbo finds empty food cartons and a carpet stain and is immediately suspicious. So let's get into it, Paul. All right. Let's do it. This is um, also, we are in season four now. We finished three seasons of Columbo. I feel like we should celebrate that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's moved so fast. Yeah, our, our turtle. Me, anyway. <laughs> our turtle speed, man. Our turtle speed gets us there eventually. Um, I just Whoa. wanted to comment on the title. So exercise and fatality is most likely a play on the phrase exercise in futility. Oh, where I did not catch that. You didn't catch that? I'm yeah. pretty sure that's what it's yeah, referring to. Definitely. Like, you know, exercise and futility, like you're you're attempting something that's not going to actually work out. It's fu- it's, you know, it's a waste of time. It's it's a futile attempt. And obviously anytime you go up against Colombo, you're probably not going to you're not going to you're not going to beat him. So, I guess that's what it means, but could be some other interpretations too yeah they couldn't call it that because that is kind of like you know colombo's the gonna get you you know mm-hmm. yes <laughs> you will lose even though that's we know that's what we're gonna get mm-hmm. yeah um so this episode opens with a exterior shot of a tall building at um 15 720 ventura boulevard and the building still looks the same and I don't, there, Milo Janis no longer has his headquarters here on Ventura Boulevard, but um, there's a physical therapy office on the street level. It looks like there's a bunch of attorney's offices inside. Um, but you could drive by and see pretty much the same thing from 1974. And quick exterior shot, then we go inside. We see there is a exercise gym in there. Everyone's wearing similar clothes, like some kind of uniform. And outside the gym is an office uh, with a woman typing on a coral pink typewriter. I love the colors in this opening scene. I don't know if you noticed them, Paul, but she has this pretty typewriter. She's sitting in a mustard yellow chair. There's a sage green telephone. um, And then she's wearing a white cardigan with navy and white dress underneath. And this is Jessica. Milo Janice's secretary. The phone rings. She turns on the recording device, answers the phone, and it's Buddy Castle calling from the Chatsworth location. Buddy wants Milo Janice to call him back. It's very important. And from here, we meet Milo, who's in the adjoining office. He's on the phone. He's talking to someone about markups. Clearly, there's a little bit of tension here about prices. And Milo has an in-office bar, but it's full of vitamins, Paul. What is up with that? I was trying to to get a little info about these in-office bars and, you know, when they when they came into fashion and when they went out of fashion, but I don't know, I couldn't really I couldn't really find any good info in a very quick Google search. You probably some people still have, you know, People who drink probably still have, you know, some bottles in a cabinet or something. But it's, yeah, the, the bar is not not quite there anymore, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this feels like it doesn't really. I was Googling it, like bars in offices, and all I was seeing was more recent news articles about how companies were putting bars in their, like, corporate headquarters for all the employees to go to for happy hour and stuff like that. So I couldn't really find like the history of the little. So they're still doing it. No, but these are like communal spaces. These are, you know, like, like a 
Oh, just like a place to eat and drink, like lunch, not exactly. not necessarily a alcoholic. Well, I think thing. there's definitely alcohol involved, but I think these are not like some in somebody's office. They have a little. Oh. This is like oh, I see at, what you're saying. You know, in the lobby of, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying Google does this, but for example, like in the lobby of Google, you know, maybe you know they would put up a bar for employees to go to for happy hour. Yeah. Anywho, so from here we are going to go out to the Chatsworth Spa. And Chatsworth is an actual location in Los Angeles. Have you Had you heard of it before, Paul? Yes. Yeah. I think I've been there. I'm pretty sure. I might have even worked at Blockbuster in Chatsworth or something. Oh, really? Yeah. Let me see. How far is it from Los Angeles? It's right next to Simi Valley. So it's the north end of LA. Probably pretty far away from Pasadena is my guess. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's more north. I think we just driven through there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. I didn't work Blockbuster there. I don't think. I did work, kind of a far to you know like a far one at one time compared to where I lived. You know. Yeah. When I was at Blockbuster. Probably not Chatsworth though. No. So this is. I'm pretty sure this exterior or even some of the interiors were filmed at the Sportsman's Lodge in Los Angeles, um, which is not up in Chatsworth. This location was used in another Columbo, Requiem for a Falling Star. They filmed some exteriors um, where the main character, Nora Chandler, was meeting up with her blackmailing person, whose name I'm forgetting. And this was a pretty historic location in L.A. I chatted about it for a bit in that episode of our show. Um, It was torn down in 2019. So it's not there anymore, sadly. But you can still see photos online if you Google Sportsman's Lodge. And um, we have a familiar face working out on a exercise bike. Yep. Mike Lally. It's Clown, Charlie. Got, got his line in there. He got his line in there. He says, hello to Milo. He's pedaling away. I kind of wonder, Paul, like these uh, exercise scenes, this is one of many how long did these actors have to exercise for? I mean, I feel like it would be really exhausting to film a scene like this. Well, I mean, if they, yeah, for Mike Lally and, and me, you know, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but I think because they move at a fast, you know, pace, I think with these, you know, these shoots that unless Peter Fox in the scene, my, you know, me guesswork here is they would only do, you know, a few takes. Yeah. Okay. So maybe his. But his, yeah, if if they're doing the whole dialogue and you still see Mike in the background, yeah, he's got to do it the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> that couldn't that couldn't have been easy. He really was sweating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Columbo sweats a lot in this episode. I don't know how much of it is real sweat, how much of it is you know, spray on sweat or something. But um, it's a lot of exercise happening, and um, so. Milo is arrives at Chatsworth. He meets up with Buddy, who called the office, and um, and Buddy Castle says that uh, you know there's some issues coming up with Jean, um, who is the owner of the Chatsworth Spa, and um, and so then Milo goes to Jean's office, which is a you know it's a part of the gym. It's like one of the rooms off of the main room. Um, and Jean is at his desk. Milo comes in and Jean is upset about the prices he's been paying for equipment and supplies for his gym. And, you know, Milo controls the prices. And Jean said he paid, uh, I think he said almost $150,000 for that franchise. And do you know what that is in today's money, Paul? No, how much? It's almost a million dollars. Whoa. Which is insane. I was looking at online just a quick quick Google of what does it cost to get to purchase a gym franchise. It's nowhere near a million dollars. So Gene so so today's money it's like thirty to three hundred thousand dollars. So Gene clearly paid a lot for this franchise. He's upset. He says he is going to bust Milo for what he's doing with the finances. He's squirreling money away, sending it offshore. Milo pretends that he doesn't know what Gene's talking about. But this is where we learn about 
the motive for what's to come. So Gene is a serious threat to Milo and his whole, you know, exercise franchise that he's built. Um, Gene, you know, he's threatening Milo's livelihood and his whole dreams. Um, did you recognize the, or look at this actor at all? I wanted, I wanted to, but I, I, yeah, I didn't, he, I, he's really good. Seeing some of the movies that he was in, like the stunt man, Return to the Living. Well, I didn't see Return to the Living Dead 2, but I did see the first one. Um, but yeah, he was good. I wanted to see something of else of his, but I didn't mm -hmm. uh, I didn't take the time. That's oh, okay. Did you recognize him? I um, was just when I was in IMDb, um, saw that he was in Col uh, Columbo. <laughs> he was in Seinfeld. Oh. He played. Um, so we're talking about Gene here. He played uh the dad right the dad yeah, yeah yeah i read that yeah like the only once though and then someone else played the dad right yeah but i feel like i saw that i feel like i saw that episode of of uh, seinfeld i don't know not that i've seen all of them but I, I think i've seen that one so yeah and i thought robert conrad was really good in this in this moment very casual and what are you talking about man hey you gotta you gotta chill out yeah you know like it's really good Real, real nice, um, uh, you know, layer there. Not, not, not being quick to get mad or anything like mm -hmm. that. You know, yeah. Just very like, hey, you gotta, you gotta calm down, pal. He's like, stress is bad for your yeah. heart or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he does a Milo does a real good job of of keeping his cool um, in front of Gene. So. Milo leaves Gene's office and can, you know, checks in with Buddy again before he leaves the spa. And he's like, don't worry, Buddy. Buddy looks genuinely worried. Yeah. He's good. <laughs> uh, he's, Harrington. Yeah. I thought he was really good. He felt really believable to me in this moment. Milo's like, don't worry. He's never going to find anything. And, and, uh, you it's know, it's like the mob. Yeah. You know, like he's like, he's like one of his, stooges you know yes it, it, immediately that's that was my thought i was like this is these guys are bad yeah <laughs> oh yes God. we'll whack them later just wait just wait <laughs> just yeah stand down <laughs> it's exactly the vibe i got too paul like this is a little mob and and buddy is one of his henchmen and yeah yeah do you do you recognize pat harrington i didn't he was he was in uh, One Day at a Time. He was uh, Schneider or something. I think his name was. He was a big role, big show uh, okay. for a number of years. And and in that show, I remember him being very different. I think uh, was his his name was Schneider. Um, I don't know if I watched that show, Paul. No, you were you were weren't even. Yeah, you weren't around when that was going on. Did you see uh, it when it was on? A little oh, no. bit. I, it wasn't. I didn't really like it. Like I just remember it, it seemed very adult. You know, like I, except for him, he seemed like the funny. Maybe he was kind of sleazy or something. I'm not sure. But he's mm -hmm. like the fix it, the plumber guy. But they liked him. Okay. But I, I, just, I just remember he was very distinct. You know, in his role, like the Fonz. You know. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you see this, and you see him in that. You can see his range. He's got a really mm -hmm. good range, and he was in. I watched the president's analyst. It was kind of like a humorous uh, James Bond. And he plays like a, um, like a weird, I won't say what he plays, but he was good. He was a very strange mm -hmm. role he had in that. And that, that actually was, I enjoyed that movie. The um, president's analyst. Yeah. With uh, okay. James Coburn, Theodore Flicker. Yeah. That, that was actually pretty good, but yeah, he's good. Pat Harrington in this yeah. role. I liked him. I'm just writing down those, um, the movie and the show so we can include it in our show notes. If people want to see more Pat Harrington, see his range for themselves. So Milo says to Buddy, hey, just to show you how much I'm not worried about this guy, I'm going to throw a party at my house tonight and we're going to watch an uncut horror movie. Bring that little gal. What's her name? Frida. I think it's a dirty movie. Did he say dirty too? I think so. 
I might he might say porno or something, I think. No, he does not say porno, Paul. Are you sure? Yes, I would remember that. I think he's this X-rated. This is Columbo. Yeah, he might say X-rated. Okay. But it can be X-rated because of the violence and the gore. <laughs> okay. Gosh. Paul, get your mind out of the gutter. Sorry. I'm just kidding. No, but yeah, X-rated, That I mean, I guess there is usually a... Yeah, I mean, that cowboy was X-rated. That's a really good movie. Okay. <laughs> but they were not what watching that. Of, what kind of X-rated movies are you watching, Paul? Midnight Cowboy, <laughs> NC-17, Henry and June. Well, Silence right. of the Lambs wasn't X-rated, was it? No. Okay. No. That's, those are like the outliers, you know, movies that they wanted to promote, but they couldn't get the, you know the rating system they couldn't get it down for whatever reason i don't think okay. they tell you I, well i i think they when they tell you they don't want to interfere but they i think they at some point sometimes they wouldn't tell you what was wrong mm -hmm. with your movie necessarily what to cut or what to trim or maybe maybe they did but they didn't tell you exactly what to trim mm. um you know when you go to the mpaa for to get a to get a to get your rating, rating. Yeah. yeah so then if you don't fix exactly what they want you could end up with the X rating or a NC-17 or something. All right. So there's going to be a party at Milo's tonight. And um, it's time to go check in on Jess back at the office, back at headquarters on Ventura Boulevard. She's still there filing paperwork. And Milo kind of, you know, he's chatting with her. And then he kind of sneaks up on her and puts the moves on her, gives her a kiss. She seems to like him as well she seems to reciprocate the kiss but this is clearly the first time there's been any kind of romance between the two of them um and so he has asked her to come to the party and to actually get there early and get things set up because he has to go out to um parker motors to talk with the owner about opening one of his gym franchises somewhere. Um, and so she's, she's, she's in, she, you know, she doesn't not, she has no idea. She's a total pawn at this point. You know, she, she's into him and she's into this party idea. And so she takes off and then he stays behind in the office and he's clearly up to some monkey business, Paul. He's like, Getting into the tapes. He's got some little scissors out. I, we have a pair of those, actually. You do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you bring them to our recording tonight, Paul? Uh, they're in the other room. Ah, Just trust oh. me, we have them. <laughs> you want to take a photo. We'll add that to our Instagram. Putting it on my list. I used to Mini used to edit the my audio tapes sometimes, mainly because they were broken, so I'd have to. But we did that at, at video stores, too. Oh, cool. So when we had VHS that would break, we had like, when I was in Milwaukee, Video uh -huh. Adventures. Um, the, Shout out to machine. Video Adventures. Yep. <laughs> I'm sure it's not there anymore <laughs> <laughs> in Milwaukee. But yeah, we had to splice that to get together. We had this little machine that held the VHS open. And then you had this, you put a little bit of tape on there and it'd fix it. Yeah. it would, you know, you'd have a little bump there, but you would you'd still be able to watch the movie. But I did that with... Um, the, you know, a lot of audio cassettes and I still have a lot of audio cassettes, like mm -hmm. mixed ones mm -hmm. with music that I don't have anymore that I, that I've saved to, to the annoyance of St. John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that includes the VHS and the cassettes. Yeah. All uh, that stuff. You can't stand. I still have some of your mixed tapes that you made me, Paul, when we were growing, when I was growing up and you were like off in college and oh, I was good. still left behind in the house. Can you have a cassette player? Um, I think we do actually have a little cassette player and we need to break that out. <laughs> yeah, I have yours, the ones you made me. Really? With uh, uh, yeah, Modest Mouse at the drive in. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. You, you know, stuff that I didn't know. And you put you in Built to Spill. Oh, yeah. Still listening I think, to. I think you had that on mixtape for me, but I know you, I heard, learned about them or him from you probably mixed cd was it a tape that probably was a oh CD. you definitely gave me mixed tapes oh okay when i was living in huntsville oh okay 
So, but yeah, I have all those. So if you need me to splice like Robert Conrad just did, I can. You've got the stuff. You've got the yeah. tools. Um, yeah. So he does this, you know, shady um, splicing and he steals a little piece of, of Gene's voice that says, hi, Jessica, this is Gene Stafford. Can I speak to him? Um I'm I'm pretty sure this is how John edits our podcasts too, Paul. It's with like a little <laughs> little tape. With the with the cassette that Zencaster creates. <laughs> yeah, Zencaster puts this onto two cassette tapes and then John does something. I think very few of those things will last. I think it's silver. I said mention the silver print. Silver print will last. Like a silver thirty five millimeter print. Oh. If it's actual silver. What happens to the the cassette tapes? They just deteriorate. Oh, bummer. Yeah, I've worked with an editor who worked on um, on one of the Academy Awards shows, uh -huh. and he said they had to get a look at all these library stuff, and like the tapes just fell apart. Oh, what a bummer. Yeah, some of them from the, from the past. But mm -hmm. yeah, they have things called LTOs Tios. that you can save stuff on. But you know, even though those are supposedly last longer, they're like really thick tapes like this. They're like little boxes. Okay. But it's that's tape, and I think that's is that tape? Maybe not. Yeah, but though people still use those, I think, to back up their their stuff. But then you have, you know, you have to have a certain temperature, so a lot of filmmakers store their footage at these, you know, places. You know, like museums have those as well, so it stays it stays you know. fresh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. I didn't know they deteriorated, but that makes sense. I mean, when you look at the actual material, it's kind of flimsy yeah all right so milo goes from his headquarter office to his home and he um sets up the recording of gene's voice in his office and he fiddles with his other telephone in the living room so that one of the little lights won't go off because he's got like multiple um lines on his telephone system and then he heads out. So he's got that stuff set up at his home. Jessica hasn't arrived there yet. So now he leaves his house and he goes to his Chatsworth spa where Gene is still working late in his office. And um, Milo has a master key. So Milo lets himself in. He goes into Gene's office and a big fight breaks out between the two of them. Because Gene says, quote, I plan to live for a long, long time. And you never say that, man, when you're about to, <laughs> when you're around your worst enemy. I don't know. It just feels like you're doomed. Anyhow, they, they fight. Um, Gene pours coffee on Milo's wrist. And Milo chases Gene across throughout the gym, strangles the poor guy with a piece of pipe. It's a little bit brutal. You know, normally in Colombo, we don't see a whole lot of, of violence. Often we don't see the, we don't actually see the violence at all. We see like as it's about to happen, but here it's, it's a little bit more violent. Yeah. The writer, Peter Fisher, he had to make a two hour episode and they even had to delete a scene because he, he had written in so much extra. Oh, okay. And there was one scene that kind of repeated itself where he goes to like a car place. And they it's it's in David Koenig's Shooting Columbo book. Oh, I'm so glad you looked at that. I forgot yeah. to do that and I forgot. This could have been him, you know, developing more scenes, you know, for a two hour episode. Just sort of filling it out. Yeah, with the violence. Yeah. Because you could have had... You, you know, because Columbo usually sort of re-steps everything and you don't always see it, you know? Right. But, but like, you could have, you wouldn't have had to necessarily show it all, I think, you know? Yeah, or they could have shown us, like, from, you know, the back of, like, Milo's back. So we just have an idea of what's happening. Um, yeah. But they showed, like, full-on, you know, uh, Gene struggling there. So it was a little... A little different, I think, than most episodes. It's interesting because Robert Conrad was known for stunt work. Oh, in his show, The Wild Wild West. Mm -hmm. Maybe he he did a, wanted did a lot to of do, his own stunts. He he, yeah, I could see that because he was a big star, big television star. 
I wonder how other people feel about it. I mean, it's not like a huge thing, but I wonder if it's like uh, if other Columbo fans are. Dear listener, you should let us know what you think about seeing that <laughs> little bit of violence there. If it was not a big deal or off-putting in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But I don't know if you went on to IMDb, Paul, and I go on there when we are prepping these episodes to see like filming locations and actors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely do it with the actors and and the, the other, like the writer or the producer or the, the composer when I have time. So if you go to IMDb trivia, actually, you don't even have to do that. You can just Google it. This episode of Columbo inspired a real life murder. Oh. Yeah. For reals. Yikes. Yeah. Man in Paris was strangled. This was in the 90s, oh, I believe. Goodness. Was strangled by his wife and her lover. And they left his body with a barbell, oh, just man. like Jean. But they got busted, thankfully. Oh. <laughs> they did well, not get like away with it that. either. I feel like I heard about that. It was kind of a big deal. It was covered in multiple newspapers online. Yeah, I did A lot hear of them that, were... Yeah. Um, a lot of the articles I saw were in French. So, but I, I definitely made sure that because I saw that on IMDb trivia and I had to see, is this real? Um, it appears that sadly it is real. Anyhow. So once Jean is dead, Milo drags him into the actual workout room across this newly waxed floor. And then Milo goes down to the carpeted locker room, which seems like such a bad idea. I mean, we talked about the carpeted bathroom in A Friend Indeed, but imagine a carpeted bathroom that's used by like so many different people. It just seems, it just seems very unhygienic, but it, yeah, <laughs> it that, probably was, feels... that was then this that was then. This is a new time, new time. Well, now we, ha- we know so much more about carpets these days. I wonder if that was set direction, Bill McLaughlin or... Yeah, maybe set direction by Bill McLaughlin. For the carpet? William McLaughlin, yes. Mm -hmm. So Milo uh, gets Gene's things out of his locker and then, you know, dresses his body up in the gym and then puts the big heavy barbell across his neck. There was a scene like that in um, My Bloody Valentine. Did you ever see that? I feel like I have, but it would have been a really long time ago. Yeah, I don't know if the band got their name from that movie. I like that band, but that movie I saw at our cousins <laughs> when I was a kid. It was really a horrifying <laughs> kind of Uh-oh. movie. But there's a scene like that where the the the, the crazy killer drops a weight on somebody's <gasps> stomach while they're doing that, and it's yeah. Oh Sorry. no! Yeah, but it's oh. a scary movie. <laughs> I, I think they remade you. it. I think they remade that movie. Oh my gosh! I, yeah. I always get a little nervous. Like um, you know, Elliot used to do a little bit of the the bench press we, we, back in college we'd go to the gym together sometimes and work out and i would spot him and he'd say can you just spot me you're not going to do much maybe just you know help me the last little bit into the just to get the barbell that last little like two inches or whatever into the holders and it was always a little bit terrifying because i'm like oh my gosh this how thing many, is so how many so pounds? heavy Oh, I don't know. Probably like 300 pounds, 400 pounds. <laughs> you know, Elliot. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have no idea. It wasn't a, it was more than, than I would lift, but I guess, you know, to spot someone, you just need to be able to relieve, you know, a few pounds of weight from the barbell. But yeah. those things are kind of scary. I don't know. Yeah. Sean used to have that. Our older brother Sean. Our older brother, yeah. Yeah, he I back in high was, school or something. Yes, and I and he, I remember he used to do that, and I did it a few times in his room. Um, did you spot I, him, or did he spot you? No, I think I just put on enough, you know, where I could handle it. But whenever I went to a gym for when I was in the swim team or something else, I don't, I don't think I ever used those again. I yeah. guess, but I think partly because I'm nervous to. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful with these things. I mean, I guess if you keep it really, really low weight, but um, I don't know. It just, <laughs> from my very inexperienced mind, it feels scary. Okay, so the murder scene, the murder's done. The scene is set, and now it's time for a party, Paul. That's right. You know, or... I love, I love a good 1970s party. 
it's a little dark in there in there in the place. Well, I guess it's going to show the film, but still. Yeah, it is dark, but that's I mean, you want it dark for movie night. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, I think this sounds like a fabulous party. Everyone looks great. They're all dressed up to watch a movie together. Um, <laughs> Jessica's there. She looks fabulous in this yeah. long white yeah. sleeve, white sleeveless dress with some rose colored flowers and it wraps up around her neck. And she has this cool, like, golden arm cuff on her bicep. It's like Princess Leia a little bit. Yeah, totally Princess Leia vibes. I wonder which... This came first, right? Maybe it inspired a little bit. I'm thinking of the Return of the Jedi, Revenge of the Return of the Jedi. And she's with yeah, the Jabba this, the Hutt. This came, this came out bef way before that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, maybe this inspired a little bit of that look. Um, and there's two other ladies there. So Milo is invited over you know a buddy and another friend and they each brought a date and they're all kind of in their sunday best it looks like they're having vodka on the rocks with a twist so again another cocktail option for us um milo shows up he says he just came from a car dealership across town he drove all the way to pasadena <laughs> yeah oh all the way to pasadena I I had to meet somebody yeah <laughs> how did you do that so quickly i know i know um and the, the guy in pasadena stood him up so milo goes into his office he gets the projector rolling and then he makes the phone call from the little record you know the recording device uh and jessica answers and this is where he plays the recording of gene's voice and and jessica says you know, calls Milo is like, it's for you. It's Mr. S Mr. Stafford. And so Milo, uh, enacts a, com a whole conversation, you know, with Gene in front of the crowd. And now Columbo is on the scene. So it's the next morning. That's all we get from that party, but it looked fun. I gotta say. Yeah. I wanted to know more about his friends. Yeah, me too. And like, Who what's this were? movie? What's this movie they're watching? How scary My Bloody is Valentine, it? I think. Like an early something version on, of that. Something on IMDb said it was like a Frankenstein something something. Okay, so in, it's the following morning back at the Chatsworth Spa, and Columbo shows up. Um, apparently, Murphy, the janitor, found um, Gene Stafford's body when he showed up for work that morning. There's cops all over the place, and one of the officers starts to tell Columbo what you know what's going on, and Columbo says, "I need my just wait." I need my coffee. Oh yeah, before I can take things in. I will have some coffee on break. So great. See, You're so gonna... I, got, so I got another thing. You know, another... yeah, that's the other thing. It's like we could have had coffee, but I can't have coffee. Right? Are you going to have coffee tonight? Seriously? Probably. Yeah. Probably a little bit. Yeah. Wow. And then you can sleep. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a. It's been a long week. As you. Know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it takes me an hour to to drive to work and an hour back, so it's like it's constantly like moving yeah, um, yeah. but yeah my, i i think because i swim you know i, I swim in the morning mm -hmm. and then i try and swim in the afternoon not very long mm -hmm. you know depending 10 minutes maybe 15 maybe okay. 20 that's you good. know but if i do that it wakes me up you know yeah. gives me a little energy and it kind of balances out the coffee but yeah the coffee definitely makes me more tired <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know but yeah I, I i can't drink too much but I'm, I'm, who knows? Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just go straight to bed. Yeah, I can't. I love coffee in the morning, and I I totally relate to Columbo, where he's like, just wait. Like I'll wake up in the morning here, and the and the girls are like, can you help me um, find a new backpack online, or you know, do this or do that? And I'm like, let me just have some coffee, <laughs> and wake up, and then and then my head can do some more things. Anyhow. Yeah, driving to work takes an hour, so. That's when I have my first cup of coffee. Yeah. And I like that. I like because like, then I can listen to another podcast or yeah, um, music or maybe something for, for my docu this documentary I've been working on for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's, it, I take advantage of that, but I enjoy that cup of coffee in the, in the car because it's not moving very fast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're just like, just like wall to wall traffic. LA traffic. Yeah. I don't envy that, Paul. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't. You can just wake up, roll out of bed, and you're. I wake ready up, I roll work. out of bed. <laughs> yeah, you go. Elliot, right? 
Well, Elliot's going to start teaching um, his, uh, so he teaches at uh, UCSC and his, so his quarter starts soon. So then he'll be going to campus to teach. But um, yeah, in the summer he does everything from home and then, yeah, it's nice when we're both can work from home. But anyhow, we digress. Columbo's there. He, uh, as, so, as soon as he gets there, just about, he has a phone call and he takes it in Mr. Stafford's office and it's from Mrs. Columbo. And she's asking him about what to make for dinner that night because there's people coming over. Someone's on a diet. Someone's this, someone's that. He says, well, how about we, he looks in the trash can in Mr. Stafford's office and he sees all these Chinese takeout containers. And he says, hey, how about we do Chinese takeout and you place the order and then I'll pick it up. I, I love how he is not afraid to get his hands dirty in that trash yeah. can. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he picks up all, he's like looking at these old bones and these, you know. Touching the evidence. He's totally touching the evidence. Um, but yeah, he's, he just, he gets his hands dirty, literally. Um, and this, so his phone call is over, but now the discovery of these uh, cartons uh, has gotten him curious and he notices that there's also a coffee stain or a coffee spill on the carpet. So now he's, his gears, his wheels are turning, you know, and he also makes his way back towards the, the body and he discovers the skid marks on the freshly waxed floor. And he has a chat with Murphy, the custodian about it. And they come to the understanding like, oh, yeah, these are brand new skid marks. These are brown skid marks. Everyone on the force has black shoes and so does Murphy. So so now Columbo has three pieces of information that are making him suspect this is not just an accident at the gym. Did you recognize um, Murphy at all, Paul? The custodian? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, I, I like, didn't recognize like him though. Yeah, I thought he was great. I didn't recognize him at first either, but he was in Candidate for Crime. He was one of the highway patrol people or patrol officers. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought he did a good job. Yeah. He's he's, he's kind of annoyed with all that's happening, um but he's also cooperative. Yeah, he just wants to do his work. Yeah. So they the skid marks lead them to Jean's gym locker. I mean, probably Combo would have gone there eventually, but they find Jean's shoes with the brown heels in his marker, in his locker. So now Columbo's thinking those might be skid marks that Jean left um, last night. And, and Columbo talks to the doctor about what he thinks happened. I'm pretty sure the doctor uses uh, some kind of racial slur talking about the Chinese food. You know, this is almost 50 years ago. So maybe, I don't know, different, different standards of what's okay to say. But anyhow, the doctor says, I don't know what, I'll let you know, you know, how he died once I do the autopsy. And Columbo tries to pick up the um, barbell. And he can't. It's too heavy. I guess it was 180 pounds. So it seems like a pretty heavy barbell. All right, Paul, we're going to go back to Milo's house. Um, so Columbo is leaving the Chatsworth Spa. I'm not quite sure. I don't quite understand how Columbo knew to go to Milo's house right away. Well, he's the... Yeah, I mean, because it's not exactly his, it, it's his name, but not his gym. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. he's not running that gym necessarily. Right. But yeah, I guess, I mean, yeah, I guess he he can't find Mrs. Stafford yet. So I guess the next most obvious name would be Milo's. But it feels like maybe you would, there would be some other next of kin or someone besides Milo. But anyhow, I guess Milo is the number one person for him to to connect with and this home it looks like according to imdb and looking on google maps it looks like it's on strathmore drive in westwood so 10301 strathmore 
this house sold over just just a few years ago for over twenty million dollars. So it's a pretty luxurious place um, and location. And Jessica has spent the night. She answers the door in a bikini, and instantly Columbo is thrown off guard a bit here, <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> he wasn't expecting this. Um, she looks like she's having a morning Bloody Mary. And Columbo says he's looking for Milo. Milo comes in to the house super sweaty. He's been exercising. And then Columbo shares that Milo's TV show really helped his marriage because his wife was depressed and... um she started watching his show and exercising, and then that kind of took her mind off of food and her emotions, and I don't know. I don't know what else. It's a funny little moment, but Milo kind of cuts him short. He's like, I'm pretty sure you didn't come here to talk to me about this. So Columbo shares the bad news about Jean. Jessica is clearly upset, so we can tell she's she did not. She did not see this coming. Um, Milo doesn't have the same reaction, although he pretends to be a little bit upset. And then Columbo notices the burn mark as he's leaving. He notices a big burn mark on Milo's hand. Yeah. So that's another little piece of information. And Columbo calls it right away. He's like, yeah. "Oh, last time I did that, it was from coffee." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So he's like, Columbo's set. He he already has his. He kind of already knows who the. The murderer is, I mean, but now he's got to piece it all together. He's got to make sense of it all. So now it's time to hang out with Mrs. Stafford. <laughs> this is our inspiration. <laughs> well, this scene isn't our inspiration for our drink and snack, but I think I've decided that she's maybe in my top 10 extra characters or like side characters in Columbo. She's just super fun to watch. Columbo shows up to her apartment. And she looks, she's in mourning. She's dressed in all black, but she still looks great. She's wearing a, this like silky black button down blouse under a sleeveless black sweater dress, long gold necklace, large gold locket. Looks like she's having a bourbon with water, some kind of mixed drink. She's very sloshy. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, you know, either a little slow or sleepy or drunk. Um, probably she's been drinking, you know, since she got the news. And she, Columbo is there to ask, you know, ask questions about, he doesn't have to tell her about the death. Someone else came and told her that he died, but he wants some information about Jean, some background information, and Mrs. Stafford tells Columbo how um, Mrs. Stafford tells Columbo about the motive, like, you know, between her and Milo Janus, her husband had nothing but problems. And she says that her husband was very upset with the way Milo ran his business. Um, so now Columbo is kind of getting even more info. And she also tells Columbo that Buddy Castle is the person who introduced Jean to Milo. Oh, and then she also tells Columbo about Louis Lacey because Columbo found some notes about a Lacey that Jean was meeting with someone called Lacey. And Mrs. Stafford remembers that there was a man named Louis Lacey who worked at Tricon Industries with Jean. So now we have a few more little pieces of information here. Um, what did you, did you have any reflections on Mrs. Stafford, Paul, or thoughts? Yeah, I liked watching her. She's, she, um, I wish there was, did, did we see her again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She's good. She's really good. I, I, she was in To Kill a Mockingbird, which I, oh, I recently who watched. Who was she in that one? She is one of the best scenes. She's so good in that movie. She's got like one scene, I think, maybe mm -hmm. a couple scenes. Um, she was because Rosemary Murphy was in that, and Rosemary Murphy played the, you know, the the uh, wife who gets killed in A Friend Indeed. Right, right. Yeah. So she, they were both in To Kill a Mockingbird. She, I, I don't. I'm. She might have been from the South, but she's 
she was in some Twilight Zones. This actress, Colin, Colin Wilcox Paxton. And so she, she knows the Southern accent really well. And I loved her and a lot of the stuff that I saw her in. She, she, she can really play a bad character, like a really mean, manipulative Ah. or broken. I don't know what, you know, there's all kinds of ways to look at the the characters she plays, but she's great. Yeah. She's very serious. I love watch. I loved watching her in this show. I I thought she just, she was funny, but also um, you kind of, you kind of feel for her too, you know, like she has heart. I don't know. And she, yes. Yeah. 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 She's like kind of smiling and then gets, kind of a sad longing look after he yeah. leaves and yeah. And she's way different in the, in the other things I'd seen her in, you know, she's older in this, but still really good. She plays a yeah. doctor in um, jaws too. <laughs> oh. I don't know what kind of doctor, maybe like a scientist. Um, okay. I'm going to have to watch that. Cause I actually just rewatched jaws recently. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to see it because it's a and- <laughs> the French director who did one of the Columbo episodes. Um, but did Jaws too? Yeah, yeah. The guy who did ah. Summer in Time, he did. Um, he did the lethal, lovely but lethal, the oh. the horror kind of one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's funny because she that makes sense. Yeah, she's a doctor in Jaws too, and then Gretchen Corbett is a doctor in this other one called Jaws of Satan. Oh, which I watched last night. <laughs> Wait, Gretchen Corbett is Jessica. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if she's in Rockford Files. You she's... watched Jaws of Satan last you, night. Yeah, Paul? you can watch it free on YouTube. It was it was a lot of fun. It was had some. There was like a couple of really good scenes, but it's a snake too. It's the snake that Satan is the snake, and these like oh, okay. unusual snakes. They shot it in Utah, Alabama. Ah, and I'm pretty sure I've cool. been to Utah a few times. Mom and Dad go there, or they used to. They stopped, thankfully. <laughs> oh, to help. They were volunteering the... there. That's right. That's right. They were um, driving like 45 minutes each way on these little country roads. I'm so glad they're done. And dad was doing that a lot. Was that to go to the nuns? Yeah, race? they both were going, yeah. driving out to Utah, and they were volunteering with um, some nuns out there. Um, yeah, every week they were doing that drive. Well, that's probably why they shot the Jaws of Satan, because that the nuns probably helped <laughs> quell the, you know, Satan and his... Watch your mouth, Paul. No, no, no. I'm going to step into some <laughs> dangerous. And, and and then the director of this this episode, Bernard Kowalski, he's good. He um he did a movie for Universal called where the scientist turns his daughter's boyfriend into a snake. Oh, like my in God. the <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. Yes, if you've ever seen the um, one of Spielberg's first movies, the um, the one with Goldie Hawn um, is before Jaws. They there's a scene. It's a good movie. It, it's a really good movie, uh, and it might be based on a like a true incident or something. But there's a scene where Gold, all these cops are chasing Goldie Hawn, I think, and you know they're telling her to stop. But they pass by a drive-in theater and they're watching. They're watching that on the. <laughs> so it's obviously a plug but i think it was one of the same producers too of um the, uh, one of the big like the jaws producer i think might have produced this how that just seems like not a great name for a movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's i didn't finish watching it but it's fun what i did see was a lot of fun uh-huh. Gosh, that's hilarious. Yeah, no, it does not, right? It's like <laughs> can't even say it. We can't. I don't know if the movie bombs. How do you spell it? It's just S S S S S. I know, but I mean 1973. Just, how many S's? How many S's? Uh, like how do you it's uh seven S's. Oh geez. Yeah. Um and the uh yeah, so Richard Zanuck produced that. He um he also produced Jaws. <laughs> well, okay all right so there there's the there's the uh, tie-in why they would show yeah well, actually jaws came later than the the other the other movie i was thinking of with goldie hahn the other spielberg film okay all right well there's the fun little little rabbit hole um Wait, yeah we well, get there's to see more. 
Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead, Paul. I'm here for it, man. Um, the name of the movie. I feel like these are my like end of episode. Uh, oh yeah, I should, be, I should be doing this at the end. No, it's everybody okay. else is like, yeah, you should have waited, dude. Um, <laughs> that one. Whoops, was called. Um, the one with Goldie Hawn? Uh, yeah. It was Sugarland Express, the Sugarland okay. Express. So that came all out right. the year before Jaws. Okay. So, all right. Okay. So Columbo goes to go work out. Are we there yet? Okay. Back to Columbo. No, we're going to the beach, Paul. I love, love, love this scene. You know, probably partly because there's the beautiful ocean in the background and the waves are breaking on the beach, but also just. I mean, this is one of the pieces of Columbo that everyone usually loves is the back and forth between Columbo and the bad guy, right? The little, the banter, the, you know, Columbo's trying to share what he knows and observe the reactions. And, you know, Columbo's just doing so much in his head while he talks to these suspects and... It's the same here, but you have the beautiful Pacific Ocean in the background. We're in, we're in Malibu. This is, was filmed at Paradise Cove in Malibu. This is a little cove. It's um, not the main surfing beach that is in a lot of Malibu type shows and movies. Have you been to this one? I have not been to Paradise Cove. I've been to Malibu um, to that beach and not here. But now I really want to go. There's so Columbo is shows up on the beach and there's a building behind him. I'm I I'm guessing that's now the Paradise Cove Cafe. There's a or a cafe or a restaurant right there in this cove, and there's a beach. Um, and Milo is swimming in some pretty big waves with some pretty small shorts on. He's also doing some push-ups in the sand, and Columbo's trying to have a conversation with him while he's you know, doing these push-ups, And the tide is also rising while Columbo's talking. So Columbo keeps having to kind of step back so that he doesn't get, you know, too wet from the ocean. And um, Columbo is on the beach to update Milo on Gene's death. He starts talking about the fact that Gene ordered a lot of Chinese food before he worked out. Here's more food, which we could have had Egg foo young, egg rolls, barbecue spare rib, ribs, and pork fried rice. So those are all the things that Gene ordered that night. Milo explains to Colombo that he's got an appointment coming up. He has to finish his workout. Can they keep talking while he exercises? And Colombo says, sure. And then all of a sudden, Colombo has to <laughs> jog alongside Milo. Yeah, he just takes off. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love this part. Oh, I just want to make a note about Milo's necklace. I don't know if you noticed his necklace, but he wears it through much of the episode. And I had to find out, like, what is that symbol? I've seen it before. It kind of looks like a cross with a circle on the top. And it is the key of life, also known as an ankh. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But it's an ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic symbol. This is from Wikipedia, by the way. Used to represent the word for life. So I guess the symbol was popular in the 60s and the 70s, and it made sense for Milo to be wearing it. It's kind of a bohemian kind of, you know, fashion statement, something that somebody who eats vitamins and drinks carrot juice would probably wear in 1974. So Columbo has to jog alongside Milo to keep you know, talking with him, asking him questions, and they jog back to Milo's house. Now, if they actually jogged to Milo's house where it was filmed, that would be a 25-mile jog. So we have to... <laughs> we have to suspend disbelief. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and just imagine that this is like a beach front or near the beach home. Um so they make it to Milo's and Milo can't stop moving. He's shadow boxing, you know, like punching the air while Columbo's talking to him. And he never really stops moving this whole time. He dives into his pool. 
he he's boxing on like a speed bag. I guess I had to Google like what is that thing? It's like a bag, a small football kind of sized bag that hangs that you can punch up in the air. Anyhow, this guy's working out. Um and Columbo keeps talking to him. He is kind of beating around the bush about Buddy Castle because Buddy has a criminal record and Columbo doesn't say that straight, you know, straight out, but um Milo knows that. He says you're talking about Buddy's criminal record. He shouldn't have gotten, you know, convicted for that. It was his business partners or whatever. So Milo kind of has the answer for this. And um and Milo in this moment really puts Col- Columbo on the spot. He's like, "Why are you here?" Um this was an accident. And and then Columbo says, well, actually, it's not as straightforward as we thought because of this, the scuff marks. So this is kind of the only thing that Columbo is sharing so far about his suspicions. And Milo offers, so they go inside and Milo offers, oh, I, I guess we should, I don't know if you remember, but there's a funny little moment where Columbo's like emptying the sand out of his shoes. Yeah. <laughs> he breaks his shoelace. It's really, I like that part. Um, and there's so the shoelaces. He's putting the shoelaces in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's trying to make it work. He like reties little pieces of it together. And then they go inside and Milo offers Columbo breakfast. And Columbo's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to put you out. And Milo insists it's not a problem at all. He's like, put, put your hand out. <laughs> and he gives Columbo <laughs> yeah. a few vitamins. And uh, yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of all the the main info that gets shared here. But you know, Milo now no, now knows that Columbo's kind of on to him, or Columbo is you know isn't looking at this as a simple accident. And the phone rings as Columbo's leaving, and Columbo notices that the light a light is out on the phone because the phone rang, but none of the little lights went off. So clearly, there's a light out. Um, so now Colombo has even more information. So Columbo is is leaving Milo's now, and he is going to head over to Tricon Industries. And this is a really fun little scene between Columbo and an uncredited actor who, according to IMDb, her name is Ann Coleman, and she actually did a little bit of other work. Um, she was on Law and & Order and a few other things. But um, it's one of those scenes, it reminds me of, the scene in um uh i think it's called blueprint for murder blueprint yes yes absolutely blueprint for murder where columbo's kind of waiting in a line kind of waiting around it's kind of quiet um this might have been one of those like filler scenes yes they koenig talks about it It was definitely improv going on here oh cool he was really milking the scene and I think I think it kind of tell if you kind of tell tell with her she's really good, but she's also like she stays on point even though she's sort of standing and like turning mm-hmm. around. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. she, I feel like she could have could have found something else like to really know what you have to do in that kind of position. Mm-hmm. You know when you but she does a good job when you um, if you do a little scene for me like if I was a bartender in a scene I'd really need to know everything that I normally would do. And practice mm-hmm. it so when you're doing take after take, you have to memorize the moves, but also you feel comfortable and you know exactly what you're supposed to do. So it's sort of natural. Mm-hmm. There, to me, there was a little bit of unnaturalness to her, even though I thought she was really good with her com- her um, her interaction with him and, and his yeah. sort of like, is it coming? When's it coming? And, and she was like, just, but yeah, go ahead, Liz. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, don't, I, I, um, yeah, I didn't even think about that piece of it, Paul, like what she's, what her work is behind the counter. 
So I think that's a cool observation that she, you know, maybe that piece of it was a little bit more, a, a little less natural, like you said. Um, well, she has the papers in her hand and she stacks them, but she continually, she stacks them a couple times at least, which is a little like, why are you stacking the papers again? Just set them down yeah, or yeah. something. You know what I mean? Like it's, it, that's not, doesn't feel uh, n- normal. Yeah. It's sort of like, oh, she, he's throwing curveballs at her. I and mean, she's keeping up with him in her mm-hmm. emotional responses, but the stacking of the paper is not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unless, unless you, you, you are uh, a little nervous, you know, with a unruly customer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's great. How he smiles. He's smiling, walk, looking at everybody walking yeah. around. So, a lot of or, so is our were his lines improv then and a lot of them in this scene, Paul. I believe so. Let's see what because I says. I loved I loved what he said. Um, I wrote I actually wrote down a lot of his lines. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so David Koenig writes. It reminded Falk of a scene in Blueprint for Murder where he got good mileage out of barely controlling his frustration at being forced to wait in one long line after another at the building permit office. So instead of fascination, Falk feigned impatience, waiting for the printout, drumming his fingers, rubbing his furrowed brow, pacing around and badgering the clerk. Unfortunately, he milked the routine for three solid minutes. Um, uh, so it was, yeah, so it was, it was supposed to be Columbo watches and fascination as the machine starts to type out a oh, resume as we see okay. computer reels. So he turned it around, did his own thing. Yeah. Um, and made it a great, you know, great three minutes. I mean, his lines, I thought this was really great writing, but it's really great improv. Um, yeah, he, yeah. Anyhow, I'll, I'll include some of the actual lines in our, um, I like to have some of the quotes in our Instagram what's, posts. What's, so. what's one of the lines? One of the lines, he's like, you sure you put the right thing in? I mean, we seem to be getting an awful lot of advice there. That's why I ask. And later he's like, <laughs> he's like, an awful sure lot of advice? Not- yes. <laughs> yeah. You sure that's not stuck? Uh, I don't know. It's really, f- I love this little moment. And she turns around at him when he's on the phone. She turns around and makes an eye eyebrow raise at him. Yes. yes. Why does so she do he- that so he gets the printout from um, the clerk and goes to the payphone. And on the payphone, he says this, you know, I'm from homicide. He might even say, like, I'm investigating a murder. I can't remember. He's like, but I, I need to talk to you right away. And and she overhears it in her. Yeah. Like you said, her eyebrows go up. Okay. Because she's like, oh, wow. Mr. Lacey needs to is part of a murder investigation. Like, what did he do? Um yeah. Yeah. That's a fun little moment. I can't believe they didn't credit her. It seems, I guess that happens sometimes, but. Oh, in the IMDb? In the IMDb and apparently not in the credits either. I think. Yeah. I mean, I think in the credits is a little tougher. They only list a couple, you know, handful mm. of people, but the, mm. but the IMDb, yeah, that is kind of, they're, they're not watching these episodes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised too. Cause even Mike Lally is uncredited as Charlie. Yeah, what the heck? Yeah. Um. Well, anyhow, one one of the little interesting uh, plot point from this scene is that Columbo calls Lewis Lacey, and uh, when Lewis Lacey's phone picks up, it's actually a recorded voice. Uh, it's his it's his outgoing voice, and Columbo gets fooled by that. You know, in the moment, he um, he, yeah, uh, that's right. And that is a another a piece for him and putting together how did Milo murder Jean, you know? So that's kind of an important um, plot point. And, um, oh, and there's this funny little bit where Columbo is not, not allowed to smoke, but at the, so he leaves his cigar on the, on the ashtray and then grabs it on his way out. <laughs> <laughs> well, he goes in the elevator and then comes back, then gets it, yeah. then goes back. In the elevator. Yes. Yeah. Much to the dismay of the security guard. Yeah. Who uh, is not pleased. Um, but yeah, anyhow, there's a lot of little gems in that scene. It was, it was fun. So let's head back to check in on Mrs. Stafford and to our snack and drink of the day. She's at home 
she's doing a lot of different things. She's actually playing the piano and smoking a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we should start doing that, Liz. Start getting the cigarettes that they smoke. <laughs> and just... Ew. <laughs> I'd have to I'd have to record this outside, Paul. I could not. Oh, come on. Think of it as an acting thing. <laughs> or you could get those fake ones that they use in Mad Men, whatever they used. Oh, they used fake ones? Yeah. I'm sure they okay. had to. All right. I, I would use a fake one for our recordings. That's fine. I'm okay oh, with that. Oh, come on. <laughs> I think that this, um, the actress, I know you said her name already, um, Colin I think, Wilcox Paxton. Yeah, I think she actually plays piano because it sounds like she's actually, I don't know. She's like playing a couple of nice chords on there and the doorbell rings. It's Lewis Lacey who, um, you know, Columbo was looking for. And he was working for Mr. Stafford to dig into Milo. And Mrs. Stafford offers him, she's like, do you want a drink? <laughs> He says, no. She's like, well, well how about wine? <laughs> he says, no. Are, are you sure I'm having some? Aww. So she's, you know, not only does she have the piano and the cigarette happening on one side, it, around the sofa, she's got a glass of wine going and an egg salad sandwich. You know, there and you go. to be honest, it could have been a chicken salad sandwich. I don't actually know exactly oh, what was in the sandwich, Liz. but I am going to say that was an egg salad sandwich. Yeah, I'd have looked, a, I'd have a glass of wine with her. Like, oh, yeah. Oh my oh, gosh, I would me. totally be I would totally be Mrs. Stafford's friend. <laughs> yeah. I would go over and she'd be like, "You want a drink?" Like, sure. <laughs> she might not want you to leave. It's just like talk to you about all of her problems. I know, right? She's like, "Do you want to listen to me play play piano?" I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> sure." What do you got? What song are you working on? Let's hear it. I, I was gonna say I'd have an egg salad sandwich with her, no yeah. problem. I'd take half her sandwich. I don't mind. <laughs> like, sure, thank you. Yeah, uh, I like how the curtains are blowing in the background because this is probably a set, mm -hmm. right? And they have this. Little, they have a little fan over there. I noticed the that too. Oh. I thought that was a nice little detail. Yeah. Makes it more real. So we, we just learn a little bit more here about, and this again, Paul, I, I mean, this might've been like filler scenes. We don't really need this scene for the story to work at all, but it's fun. I really like it. And Lewis Lacey explains to Mrs. Stafford, he's been trying to kind of investigate Milo and how he handles his accounting, what, you know, what he does with all the money and he wasn't really able to find a crime, but, uh, you know, he's certainly doing things in a way that, you know, could lead to some shady stuff. It's, it's kind of shady, but it's all legal. Yes. Basically is the conclusion. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's what I thought in the very beginning. I'm like, well, this is how a lot of businesses run. You know, you don't know, normally, I mean, they may not <clears throat> always be owning all the companies, but a lot will want you to get there. Like for, for like Monsanto has that, mm -hmm. owns the seed that dies yeah. and then owns the pesticide. And then, oh, so you have to have all these things just from them. Right. I mean, like literally, literally they want you to use, in a, if they can get a patent on the water, I imagine that they might try to do that at some point. <laughs> Right. You know, yeah, but it, it's a little, it's a little microscopic version, I think, of what a lot of companies or some at least do already. Yeah, and I think that that I mean, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a tax attorney or anything, but it that that's not even necessarily like the illegal part. But I think part of it that was sh extra shady, although that that is definitely shady, and you know, it could have been like. um he could have been very misleading to his uh, oh, yeah, he's investors. Like on that. Yeah. So there's a lot of like misinformation, but also the fact that he's moving money offshore to these other accounts, I think is the other piece that's really shady that, that he seems to suspect that something could come back around and he's getting his money out of the country so that no one can come for it. And that's kind of the piece that i don't know i mean maybe that's fine too i don't know <laughs> well i mean that's you know 
There's a whole a whole, lots of other discussions we could go into with yeah. With, I'm not um, an expert on any of this entities but, um, and you know corporate corporations and stuff. Yeah. That that fail and then banks get bailed out, but people yeah. who made them fail weren't doing stuff weren't smart about how they were you know moving the money or what they were selling. Mm -hmm. um, but well, it's similar to making something that, that you know will break so they have to buy the mm -hmm. new version or the way phones are now or right you know it's all it's all very some of it's kind of similar yeah. you can if you can figure out a way where you charge somebody a month like avid the editing software that i use mm -hmm. i use premiere software too but i pay by the month mm -hmm. instead of just paying a flat fee and you have it mm -hmm. and then you have to update it um so if you update some stuff then you update your other versions, just like the Mac OS will only go with certain versions of, so if I had Final Cut 7, which is editing software, which I used to have, I can't use it on any of the new Macs. I have to upgrade mm. um, to a completely different version of Final Cut. Mm. That's completely different. Like you, you literally, you have to pay for that. You can't get yeah. money because you bought Final Cut 7 and it's a subscription base now, just like right. Microsoft Word where you are forced to pay monthly. It's a, it's a tactic that um, I don't like, you know, but yeah. it's legal and it makes them yeah. lots of money and right. it's smart on that end. Right. So, but there, you know, there's all kinds of ways to look at this. Yeah. But it, it is interesting because yeah, it does seem like it's all legal. Right. So why would he feel the need to kill him then? I know. Right. I, I think, well, you know, he threatened a class action lawsuit. Oh, that's so, true. You know, maybe there was enough of there was enough deception in the, you know, selling of the gyms, the franchises that he would have grounds for a lawsuit. You know, I don't know because if he didn't, if Milo didn't disclose uh, appropriately, you know, the costs, the the expenses. Um, I don't know. Maybe there'd be a case there. Like I said, I don't know. I know very little about this. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. That's. I mean, there are people do win those kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. You know. For, yeah. For something like that, I think. Um. Okay. So. So, uh, Lewis Lacey leaves the paperwork with Jessica, and she's clearly interested, intrigued. She opens it up, and she's going to dig into it a bit. And um, and now we go to check in on Buddy Castle because Columbo is at the Chatsworth Spa. He arrives right as Buddy is getting into his red Corvette. <laughs> with his red tie. With his red tie and his red and black plaid pants. And, um, you know, Buddy, I, again, this actor, Pat Harrington Jr., I think is really good. He he does a good job of, of sort of asserting his rights in a sense. Like, yeah. you know, Buddy's had run-ins with the law in the past, so he knows what he has to do and doesn't have to do. And so he's very, you know, succinct with Columbo. Um, he doesn't lie to Columbo, and he says, um, you know, you got to talk to Milo. Any business things, you got to talk to Milo. So, so, so Buddy's a dead end. Buddy's not going to give Columbo anything good, you know. He knows his rights. So, so Columbo goes back to Jessica back at headquarters. She's in the office again and Columbo reintroduces himself. But she remembers him um, and, and a call comes in while he's in there. And so Columbo learns about the recording system, which is very helpful for his case. And um, he actually, Jessica gets two calls and the second call is from Mrs. Stafford and Columbo asks, can can I hear how that works? Can you play it back for me? And so Jessica plays back the recording and Columbo asks that uh, Columbo says, that reminds me of my sister-in-law. Does she always sound like that? <laughs> Jessica, Jessica says, how's that Lieutenant? You know, a little smashed. <laughs> so Mrs. Stafford's been, been into the wine again. And Columbo learns that they have a lot of recording of Mr. Stafford's voice Jessica gives a very accurate recollection of what happened the night of the murder at, you know, from while she was at the party. 
she remembers exactly how the phone call came in and when the movie started and um and Columbo asks her like so is Mr. Stafford used to hearing your voice at um Milo Janice's house too and she says no actually that was the first time I ever was over there and so you know Columbo's got all kinds of great evidence here and as he's leaving you can see that Jessica feels a little bit unsettled about it all too she's like her wheels are turning too that that is kind of weird how it all went down that night yeah yeah i like that she recognizes that yeah and like considers the gravity of that yeah that's how her character is in rockford files i mean she she's friends with rockford um she's a lawyer in that i think uh but she's 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 i wish she she had a little more sometimes but she's always really good in in Rockford Files. She's kind of catches on fast and um well in this one she, it's she's she's not with the bag, you know, like the here she's with Milo, you know, and she doesn't yeah. realize that he might be really bad. But in in Rockford she's always trying to help him as a lawyer. She's always giving him information and she goes on some investigations with him. Okay. Um I can't remember if I, but I think they're just friends if i remember correctly but i i could, I could be completely wrong mm-hmm. um but yeah she was in portlandia she's she was in. oh really uh, yeah yeah she's in season three and I th- she might live up there um she's in, she was in season three and she played like a um a it, like if you run a bed and breakfast she comes to check it out mm-hmm. and and they have all these like really kind of like gnarly old like dolls and rooms and stuff and like the and, but she's all for that um so yeah, and she's in the movie pig with nicholas cage which got um some good really good reviews and i think nicholas cage got nominations and stuff so she's still she's still doing stuff like cool stuff oh so but, she's still alive yeah yeah ah we should reach out to her yeah That's awesome. but yeah she's the main character in that that's one sketch from from season three in Portlandia. Okay, I love Portlandia, but I can't think of that sketch, so I'll have to go back and rewatch it. I'm writing all these shows and movies down too, so people who are listening can check your podcast player later and pull up all these recommendations. Okay, so now we are we are out at a restaurant. It's Milo and Mrs. Stafford, Ruth Stafford meeting up at the restaurant oh that's and... right yes yes yeah you remember forgot this? about the scene yeah she's so good yeah. this is a great scene she's so good he offers her some chianti and she says no i want to keep my head clear <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure she has like a glass of scotch or something yeah yeah she definitely has some kind of drink but she's like wait just... a minute why do you want to get me drunk yeah <laughs> Um, I spent a little bit of time trying to find this restaurant because it felt like a real restaurant, not like a set. But, you know, sometimes I, I'm wrong. I don't know. I could not find this restaurant, but it has red booths or like it's hard. To, I think they're red. They could be like a, a, well, you know, kind of a brownish red. And then there's sort of like nautical themed decor. <laughs> yeah. There's like these ropes and these winches or i don't know things that you put the ropes around on the boat um in the like right behind them where they're sitting yeah there's there's restaurants like that in mobile alabama (laughs) yeah maybe they filmed this in mobile alabama but it's yeah definitely be like seafood you know yeah anyhow i don't know where it was filmed but it's a cool space and this scene she wants to confront milo but milo is he's pretty sharp he's like He's not going to show any weakness here. And um, he actually invites her back to his place. So (laughs) he's he's just the worst. She's she's like, I think you murdered my husband. And he's like, you want to go back to my place now? (laughs) And so she um, gets up and throws wine in his face. And And then one of the um, waitresses comes around. And gives him a lot of attitude too. She kind of glares or stares, or we can't quite see her face, but he's like, 
do you, do you need something from me? Yeah. But yeah, this was a fun little moment. I I just love seeing Mrs. Stafford. I, I love all of her scenes. And and here we we just see even you know we see Milo at even a a lower lower level, even slimier <laughs> than before. So now it's the next morning, and Milo is headed back to Chatsworth Spa. Checks in at the spa with Buddy, who's been kind of keeping an eye on things. Buddy says we have a small problem. And we see Columbo is at the spa working out on the treadmill. <laughs> That's Dad's some... favorite scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> true or false? Uh, true? False. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it would be a good one. Yeah. It's funny. I don't know Dad Columbo's... would have a favorite scene, though. I think Dad just likes it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the. I think this is the one that he's him and mom have seen so many of these, these uh, detective shows like foreign ones and British ones, you know, Mm -hmm. Danish ones. This as I think it takes the cake for them though, right? Like they've seen this a bazillion times. Columbo. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, this takes the cake. Pretty hard to beat, especially these these early ones. Yeah, I tried to watch a Rockford Files movie. Um, ah. so, so he he did some later ones. So their their shows were really hectic and fast, and he, they did a lot of episodes. Um, but I I stopped it. I couldn't get very far. Um, they had all Uh-oh. the same actors. Watch, careful what you say, Paul. You might have some Rockford Files fans on here. <laughs> well, well, I love the series, the regular series. Um, it's, I mean, it's different than Columbo, of course, but yeah. But it, I wonder if the Columbo later series stuff is similar to this Rockford Files, and mm. I have a feeling it is in terms of interesting. You know, it still had David Chase, the Sopranos guy. It still had uh, Juanita Bartlett. She wrote the. The one I was going to watch with um, Gretchen Corbett, I didn't give it a chance. I like I, I, you know, sometimes I, I start something and depending on how tired I am or what kind of mood I'm in, um, I'll just stop it. You know, I'll be like, oh, yeah. okay, this is not, you know, it's not doing it right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. I do that all the time because life is short. So yeah. So I wonder <laughs> if these Columbos will be that way. <laughs> The later ones? The later ones, yeah. I know, maybe. Uh-huh. I, I mean, said, some of them I've seen oh, are seen fun. Some? Okay. Yes, I've definitely seen some, and they're super fun, for okay. sure. Um, I have not seen all of them. So, yeah. Columbo Goes to Japan? How is that one? Is that a one? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Be a good oh, one. I'm, I'm so gullible. It'll be a good oh. It'll be. It'll be the new... Um, What's the one that you wanted me to watch? The the girl poker from... face. Yeah, poker face. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I love. All right, poker okay, face. real quick. You like you like poker face? The pilot. I love it. I love it. Okay. What about you? Yes, I like I liked it. Okay. All right. Yeah, I liked. I watched the first one uh, with Saint John, and um, she's a little more critical than than I was. Uh huh. She liked it, but she thought okay. some of the stuff was a little. Um, it's different. Yeah. So. So, dear listener, if you have not seen Poker Face, we're talking about a a relatively new, not detective show. It's a murder mystery show starring Natasha Lyonne. And the uh, the creator was inspired by Columbo and other shows. Yeah. Um, You can tell with the credits in the beginning. It does the the date and stuff. It's like, oh, yeah. Totally. Because Um, all shows did it. And a lot of movies did that. They showed you the copyright at the beginning. but But the yellow fonts and stuff, obviously. Yeah. The same font, a lot of little nods to Columbo. Um, definitely different. Definitely not. She's not Columbo. She's not like a modern day female Columbo, but she has her own skills. I think, Paul, you and I need to do like a little special bonus episode where we just talk about the pilot. For Poker okay. Face. Yeah, I want to watch more on them. More that I think about it because there, there's some stuff I won't say anything that I, but I, I um, am cu- curious to see how they play some stuff out. I knew that was Ron Perlman. I won't say which character, but his voice, you know how you just hear his oh, voice? Yes. I was like, oh, that's yeah. Ron Perlman. Yeah, yeah. Because he He's recently, did, he, I don't know if you saw that thing he he did on his um, Instagram or one of those. He he mm-hmm. he kind of threatened uh, Hollywood 
agent person who was saying, I hope that the strikers lose their houses. And, and he went on, on Instagram. Mm. I think it was Instagram and, and like said, Oh, so you think people should lose their houses? Is that what you think? Like, <laughs> and, and he got, he got, he got, he got like the character he played in drive. He got, he got really scary really quick. And it was pretty uh, awesome in some ways. Um, yeah. But then I think he had to retract a little bit of that saying, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to put violence out there, but yeah. But when I heard his voice in the poker face, I was like, Oh, that's Ron Perlman. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of good actors. Oh there's yeah, a lot yeah. Of great guest stars. In oh the, yeah, in the those, series. Yeah, the, all the actors in that. I love the her friend. I should look oh, her yeah. up. Yeah, she's, she's in Orange is the New Black. Um, okay, is that what she's from? Yes. Uh, she's great. Okay, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to table this. Yeah, all, sorry. Maybe do a bonus episode. Um, it's super fun. If you're looking for something to watch right now, Poker Face, you might like it. It's it's not it's not Columbo. I'm just gonna say that but there's pieces that are great. Um, okay, so back to Chatsworth Spa. Columbo's there on the treadmill. It's a real old-timey treadmill where he's wearing a belt and he's like <laughs> flipped into some ropes. <laughs> like, what is this low-tech treadmill? And he says, it's a whole different attitude. It's going to make a new man, a new man out of me. I'm skipping beer. I'm giving up cigars. <laughs> no more chili. Paul, he's giving up chili. He's giving, cigarettes, beer is, is chili. It's all his favorite things. It's, you know, it's a little crazy. Um, and he's like, I need to ask you a few more. He's like jogging. Can I, can I ask you a few more questions, Mr. Janice? And, you know, Milo blows him off. He's like, I got to go to my office. I got work to do. So Columbo follow basically follows him you know milo's seated at his desk and colombo pops in very shortly after with more questions now he wants to ask him about the barbell because like i mentioned it's 180 pounds pretty hard to lift up milo's like there's anyone a lot of people here who could do that um i like his shirt <laughs> milo's shirt the polka dot uh, white polka dot shirt he has i did not write this shirt down but yeah milo ha milo has some nice shirts in this this uh, episode yeah that's a, uh, when they go into his office that's the i love i love conrad's responses to everything mm -hmm. he's like what do you want you know yeah yeah didn't we already talk about this but his yeah. delivery and his combativeness is really i really liked it yeah i was gonna watch an interview with him he he was on um Oh gosh, there's there's a there's oh gosh this I can't remember the name but there's there's a um it's not the um the one with the famous guy who interviews you oh the actor studio guy yeah it's not the actor studio but there's some other program similar to that where actors are interviewed and they post the interviews online and they kind of break them into chapters where anyhow there's a there's oh, yeah, a yeah. Robert conrad interview on there broken down if you want to like look at his different chapters of his his life his career but i just didn't have time but i was looking to see did he talk about his time on colombo and oh yeah that would have been good it didn't pop up as one of the chapters they do talk about bernard kowalski on that it's like the academy of television i think interviews you're talking about oh okay yeah that's probably yeah and they can if you type in someone like bernard kowalski and if someone mentions him, they'll they will sh they will take you to the excerpt of where they mention him and why. Um, Kowalski okay. was at a company that uh, Sam Peckinpah was at. It's a small production company, and um, Kowalski was uh, worked with the Mission Impossible, um, the guy who helmed that the, the television mm -hmm. series. And I think well, yeah, Kowalski directed the pilot of Mission Impossible. Um, oh, cool! It's very successful. But Kowalski they, did multiple Columbos, right? This isn't his only Columbo. Yes, yeah, we watched one of them already. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's he's he did uh, independent films like he did this one called um, it's a black and white one. You can watch it on online for free. It's called Attack of the. It's really fun. It, um, Attack of the what is it called? Attack of the Jelly Monsters or something like that. But it's yeah. it's not that. It's attack. It's Night of the Blood Beast. No, Attack of the Giant Leeches. That's it. Attack of the Giant Leeches. <laughs> that was good. Some really good actors in it. Um, cool. 
uh, this one guy, um, uh, Bruno Visada. Uh, what was it? Yeah, Br- Bruno Visada is really good. But you know, it's got it's real. They're real. They're real inexpensive films, you know. But he yeah. he he his biggest film was East of Krakatoa, which I actually have the vinyl soundtrack for. They oh. they had it at um at Video Tech, um for for it was used and it plays good. It's it's, it's like a movie with Sal Minio, Brian Keith, kind of an odd big. But I think it was the biggest budget film he did. And I could see why it probably didn't. I think it was like mixed reviews. Mm-hmm. Um, but what else did he do? But that was like I think the biggest one he did. In terms okay, of I'll the put budget. these in our show notes. Yeah, East I, of Krakatawa, Attack of the called, Giant Leeches. You know, what, yeah, what, yeah, Attack of the Giant Leeches. You can watch online. So yeah, Roger Corman's brother produced those. Uh, Gene Corman and Roger helped out, but it was mainly Gene getting it. You know, getting it done. Um, Wait, who's Roger Corman? Roger Corman. Uh, he gave a lot of people their start. I want to say oh, okay. Coppola and Jonathan Demme and they would put him in their film, but he produced all these like independent low budget oh, horror okay. and violent and kind of crazy, a variety of films. Um, but he gave a lot of the John sales, a lot of, a lot of people, their starts, James Cameron, I think. Um, oh, wow. Paxton worked at the office. Um, there was a painter that lived in our neighborhood in Highland park that we were friends with who used to work there with those guys, um, Guadalesa, uh, she's a really good painter. Um, and she would, she told us about those days years ago, but yeah, like death race with John Carrot or David Carrot was it David Carradine. But yeah, if you, he's like the godfather of independent film, I guess you could oh, say. Okay. All right. Um, Roger he, Corman. Yeah. He knew how to, to, to kick it out. Um, like he did one with Ben Gazzara about mm-hmm. Al Capone. Um, cool. So I guess his brother d- did these even more low budget <laughs> films, yeah. Which were, um, you know, because sometimes if you have good writing, you have some really good scenes, you know, that that kind of make it worth it. But Kowalski directed trials uh, episodes of Trials of um, O'Brien, which was Peter Fox's first one of his first TV series, where he plays this lawyer. You can watch those online for free too. Okay, he's, he's a very different character. He's very like quick and. Um, but Krakatoa East of Java is was the name of that big budget oh, film. East of Java. Yeah, and, and it's actually west of Java, but the producers thought that East sounded more <laughs> exotic, I suppose. Um, oh, that's but funny. He, he did a movie called Stiletto. I really wanted to see that one. Uh, the one he did called, oh, he did one called Tallahassee 7000. It was a TV series. I wonder if mom and dad were in that. <laughs> as extras yeah you never know so a hot car girl that one was supposed to be good hot he... car girl yeah okay i didn't make the name lose. okay <laughs> same writer leo gordon he did the uh, leeches one i think and gene so produced this one too so you know they, they might have made that oh it says santa cruz productions incorporated oh Something local, huh? Yeah. Yeah, there was a there was a there's a electronic um composer musician Bana Hoffer, B A N A H A F F E R. She recorded something in Santa Cruz not too long ago hmm. that I have. It's and I was like, Wow, she went to Santa Cruz. I should have I wish I'd known she was up there performing. Mm-hmm. I would have come and stay with you guys, maybe. Yeah, you should have come and hung out. Could have gone and hear some electronic music. I haven't done that for a while, since high school probably. Gone to a show? No, no, gone to see an electronic show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I'm trying to think the last one I went to was, uh, mm, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. I've been to, I've been, I mean, I go to shows here, but just not electronic shows. Yeah. Um. Okay, so back to the episode here. Columbo is talking to Milo. He's telling Milo, you know, he's he's doing what he does, where he's like, you know, sharing little bits and pieces about the case, seeing his reaction. Um, I love that he's carrying around his little cop's notebook and his workout towel. I don't know if you noticed that, but he's like 
he's in Milo's no, office and he, he pulls out his notebook oh, from his yeah yeah because he doesn't have his whole you know get up he's wearing a blue sweatsuit oh which I should point out this is the first time he's not wearing his trench coat his oh, raincoat and his really? suit yes yeah it is weird it was really weird seeing that it's really weird I I, I thought I was like oh you know he's in Peter Fox in pretty good shape too. You can't really see that in his his um when he's always wearing his his coat. But here I was like, oh, he probably does actually like go on a treadmill or I don't know something. Yeah, he's a pretty he was a pretty trim person in this um in this series. Anyhow, I was just telling like my daughter today. I was like, yeah, you never need to comment on a person's body. And like here I am commenting on Peter Fox's body. I'm sorry. It is. Forgive me. <laughs> um, anyhow, so Columbo finds his gets his alibi, his quote unquote alibi for the night of the murder. He Milo claims he was going out to Parker Motors, but he got stood up. He was driving out to Pasadena, um, and then um, Columbo leaves, and Milo leaves shortly after. Even though he's just said he's got so much work to do, but then he gets up and leaves. I feel like this happens often in Colombo where someone's like I'm so busy I can't talk Yeah, and then Colombo leaves and then they leave immediately after and he catches them yeah yeah so that happens here and Colombo brings up Mrs. Stafford um, and the fact that apparently you know somehow the disagreement they had at the restaurant came to light I, I don't quite know what how that happened she also went and spoke to folks in the bunko department of the police department which is fraud basically the bunko division to talk to them about how milo does his finances and now milo draws a firm line in the sand he says you know you want to talk to me you have to come through my lawyer i'm not gonna i'm not gonna get into this with you so he he uh, he does a really good jo- job, you know, keeping his kind of keeping his cool and you know setting himself up for protection, basically from the law. Um, and now we go to the hospital. So according to IMDb, the exterior here was Glendale Memorial Hospital in Glendale. It looks really different today, but you know hospitals go through all kinds of renovations all the time, I'm sure. And the interior felt like a studio for sure. Columbo is rushing through the hospital to find and see Mrs. Stafford, who accidentally overdosed on booze and pills. And um, I just wonder, where is the Stafford son in all of this, Paul? Do you remember she mentions that their son went off to college. I don't remember that. She mentions that in the beginning when she talks about their divorce. Okay. Anyhow, maybe he hasn't been able to catch a flight home, but this feels like a, a good moment for your your college child to come home and check on you. Yeah. But um, she's going to be okay. She's stable. And Columbo heads out to the waiting room to just sort of sit and wait a while. I'm not sure how long he was going to wait there but milo is there and milo wants to know how she's doing and this is one of those moments where colombo gets really angry and before i think before we hit record paul i was mentioning how oh no no at the beginning when you were talking about the s when you were sharing excerpts from the essay i mentioned how there there is a moment of rage in here um colombo is really angry at milo because Columbo knows that Milo is really insincere. He doesn't care at all about the Staffords. I was looking at um, the Columbo file blog. I, they have a great map of filming locations. So I was on there. And then I was wondering, I, I bet um, he's written about C- Columbo's moments of rage. And he has. And there's actually a blog post on Columbo's six moments of rage <laughs> and kind of what they mean. So I was looking at that. It's very interesting. Um, we'll include a link to the blog in our show notes. But, you know, Columbo gets angry just five other times. And 
sometimes it's strategic. It's not actually emotional. Sometimes he's trying to get a reaction and move his case forward. In this moment, there's no strategy. It just feels like he's really angry. He's not, you know, the rage isn't going to help his case at all. Um, he's just really upset with Milo because this woman, you know, nearly died because of Milo's, you know, all the things that Milo's done, you know, the murder, but then also blowing her off and laughing at her. I think the first time I saw this, I thought there was something else happening in this waiting room. I thought maybe all these waiting room people are actually cops and they were all like taking notes and somehow that was going to be used as evidence against Milo but no they're just people in the waiting room and they are overhearing this back and forth between uh, Columbo and Milo do you like that hat the lady has yes I love all of it I love all of the she looks familiar I feel like she's in another Columbo or something Oh, we're going to have to watch um, the, uh, oh gosh, how am I blanking on the name of our our YouTube buddy who does the great Watch it for days. Dives. Watch it for days. Watch it for days. Yeah. I bet Watch it for days tells us who that um, character is. Yeah, she's really good. She's really good about finding all those extras. Well, the, the last, like, key plot piece that happens in this scene is that Columbo notices a mom tying her son's shoes. And that's another light bulb moment for Columbo. So final scene, Columbo, oh, sorry, final scene, Milo shows up to his office back at headquarters. Jessica's not there. She's not in her de- at her desk. And so he goes into his interior office and pours some juice And the phone rings, and he answers it, and it's Gene's voice on the phone. And so Milo immediately goes to Jessica's desk, finds Columbo there, and he's angry. And, you know, Columbo, in this final scene, starts laying everything out to Milo. He says, "Um, I found the tape that you used to get Gene's voice and then he goes into the the big ending, and I gotta say, Paul, that this is probably for me personally one of the least satisfying gotcha moments. Definitely, because, yeah, because Columbo's like going on about these shoes. He shows his own shoes. He shows his gym shoes. He shows yeah. a photo of Jean shoes, <laughs> and he he says basically he's gonna convict Milo on the way that Jean's shoelaces are tied and the fact that Milo um, signed a, you know, made a sworn statement that Jean was already in his gym clothes when they spoke. And so since he knew he was in his gym clothes, he must have been the person who put Jean's shoes on because someone put Jean's shoes on, not Jean. And that is the end. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if he would, like, like if he would, why would he give up for that? You know, like, it, it's it's too, it's too long in some ways, and it doesn't seem finite, or is it the right word? It doesn't seem succinct of, like, boom, you yeah. know, like, you going to tell me his shoelaces are backwards? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not a smoking gun at all. It feels like a stretch. I mean, there's so much that I love in this episode and then I've all I've it's never been one of my favorites and I think it's only it's just because of the ending. There's just not I need that a little bit of closure, the satisfaction. And, there's so much so much explaining. Why do you have to have so much explaining if it's that easy to understand? Yeah. You know. But Way I I, I do I do want to watch it again because there's a lot of good stuff that Yeah, that just happens. watch it up to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the scene before this and then you can be done yeah the 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 ending is disappointing for me i gotta say maybe that's and, the and editing, he, you know well i think it's the i think it's the story i think they needed to have a better um gotcha gotcha this is not the gotcha there should have been something else that i don't know what that would be because i'm not 
a, a great a writer, but it feels like this gotcha is is just the worst. It's the worst that they could have chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Shoelaces? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> come on. Is there nothing besides shoelaces? Yeah. And then we also don't get the satisfaction. You know, maybe he could have. Here's what they could have done, Paul. They could have used the shoelaces and then gotten him to, to somehow confess. And then, the, and then that might be satisfying if there was like a secret, you know, listener or recording or something like that. Yeah. He's such a bad guy. Like part of me is like, why wouldn't he just kill Columbo and like make it look like an accident again or something? <laughs> you know? Another barbell but, accident. But, but that would just be, yeah, he wouldn't stand a chance. Oh, yeah. So what would you give know. it? What, what's your rating for this one? You know, it's hard because actually rewatching it, as as always happens, I, I see a little more that I like. And I remember, oh, this one has so many fun food and drinking things. And I love Mrs. Stafford. She's so fun to watch. Um, but then the ending is just so disappointing. So I don't know. Maybe I would like. Don't say it. Give it. <laughs> <laughs> give it. Maybe I give it like a six and a half. Whoa. Maybe a seven. Nice. Maybe a seven. I'll give it a seven. I'm being too hard on it. <laughs> huh. I was going to give it an uh, 8.2. Oops. 8.2? Yeah. Okay. But maybe because I really want to watch the uh, um, the actress, the Colin Wilcox Paxton stuff again. And just watch the whole thing, you know, like some of the scenes where he's yeah. trying to get, well, he's all sweaty and he's in his gym clothes and he's talking to Conrad, see how that, that plays again. But yeah, it was, I was the same thing. Like I was like, it was like going on forever about the shoes. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this is, but that could be with the editing. I wonder with the editing, if they could have made it a little more concise and sh quicker to the point. Mm -hmm. um, but then it probably tougher to explain. So they had to have the, all 10 minutes of <laughs> showing the talking about years. shoelaces for 10 minutes. Yeah. That's it's way true. too long to talk about shoelaces. Can't yeah. be 10 minutes. Okay. No, but you're right. There's so much. Yeah. It's interesting to think about like, how much do you let a bad ending ruin your whole enjoyment of a show? Um, like if I told, if I just took out the, the ending, the last scene, <laughs> you know, I, I would give it a way higher, like, yeah, probably an eight. I th I mean, all of the actors, I thought all the actors were great. Yeah. And um, there's some great filming locations. You know, I love that. I love being out, them being out in, out and about in different places. I love the, the costumes and the foods and the drink. And there's some really funny moments. Um, yeah. The bar scene, the scene with the wine, th throwing the mm -hmm. wine on him. Yeah. I think I I think I let the um the ending really shape my my rating. So maybe I should go easier and give it like an eight or something. I don't know. Has there been other things like movies that you've seen where the ending you didn't like the ending and it it ruined it, or maybe not ruined it, but you 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 kind of like. I feel like there there had has to be some some stuff like that. I'm sure there is, but nothing is jumping to mind right now. But yeah, like if the ending is just like everyone dies and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm never watching that again. That was awful. <laughs> well, there, I have to, um, there, there is a movie like that. I won't say what it is, ruin everything, but I thought it was great because of that. Oh, really? You like that? Yeah, yeah. Like I was like, whoa, I did not see that coming. Yeah. No, I mean, they, I'm sure there could be moments where I'm like, I appreciate that, but I'm just trying to hypothetically like that might be a reason where I right would. no I know what you're saying yeah because there are films where you're like no I didn't want him to die I loved him yeah okay so you gave it like an 8.2 Paul mm, yeah I think so I think okay. I, I think I have to watch it again because it was fun yeah it was really good Manuel de, de Pena was a photographer in this and he was like one of the uh journalists interviewing Lawrence Harvey in the chess match one Oh, okay. He didn't, have any, he didn't have any lines in this. Though. They might have they edited it out, but he got 
credit at the end here on the on the credits for photography. Uh, yeah, well, he was he, he was a photographer. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a little darker skinned, real thin, yeah. tall guy. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, yeah, I, th- I think I think yeah, I don't think it bothers me too much. Okay, it's a bummer, but it's like there's so many other cool things. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot um, of other good, good things going on for sure. Um, all right, Paul, do you have any trivia questions for me, or did you use up all your trivia already? Maybe, yeah. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna do my best. Oh, oh, remember the guy who was in uh, Rand's um, the art critic one where he's yes, yeah. So, him and Robert Conrad were in Wild Wild West together, they were the main characters. So, in the making of that, Robert Conrad uh, accidentally cracked his skull, Ross Martin, no. in, a, in a stunt. What? No, I'm gonna say that's false. He cracked his own skull. <laughs> How did you know that? I don't know. Yeah, he did Am something right? like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he he, yes. hurt, he hurt his own skull. Like he was he was like swinging yes. from a chandelier, and the, um, you know, he did so many of his own stunts, but he like yeah he like fractured it. You know, like he. Oh my god. So he had a I think he had a bar that wasn't taped on the chandelier, so a bar, and he fell back and then hit oh. his head. And he had a concussion and he almost died, I think. Oh my god. So he was out, yeah. But they, they were like, Okay, we gotta <laughs> we gotta watch these stunts you're doing. Um Jeez, He talks he That's talks crazy. a lot about that. Jackie Chan, I think, uh, was very aware of him as an actor stuntman, you know. Okay. Um but I think Rockford James Garner, the same kind of stuff for him. In Rockford Files. He did his own stunts too? Well, he got like a lot of driving and like a lot of fighting, you know, like there's a lot of fighting okay. in, in, in both of those shows. So you're doing your, 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 there's a lot of stunts you won't do, but there are some that you mm-hmm. are doing, you know. Um, but uh, okay, here's another one. Okay, another I got one. one. You got one. I got one, yes. Okay, so the uh, composer, the guy who composed part of uh, Friend Indeed and other Columbos, Billy Goldenberg, um, he took the editor, Billy Goldenberg, to court for having cashed a paycheck of $35,000. So the editor, Billy Goldenberg, cashed the composer, Billy Goldenberg's check. Oh, dang. And so Billy, the composer, wow. took him to court. Okay. True or false? I'm going to say true. It seems like it could happen. False. False? False. Ah. No, he did. He did. Uh, the editor did get calls saying, hey, we have a check for you here. And he would go and be like, this isn't for me. This is for the composer, Billy Goldberg. Wow. That is so confusing. Yeah. How do you have two Billy Goldenbergs working on the same show? Well, 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 the the editor never worked. The editor's uh, still editing stuff. He, he didn't never worked on Columbo. Oh, OK. Um, but he did get. He did get calls saying, hey, we have a check for you. I don't know what studio it was at or uh, the okay. exact thing, but um, true story. And and, yeah. and he was always like, this isn't me. This, this is not my check. Well, good for him. Yeah. I mean, geez, Louise. Yeah. They did meet each other um, at one point, but I don't know. Uh, I don't think much ensued. Yeah. Um, there were no fist fights. There was no fist fights. Yeah. No money was stolen. <laughs> no money was stolen. <laughs> That's good. I like that. And I think, uh, let's see. We got one more, Paul. Um, maybe. Right now I'm at 50%. Uh, that's a failing grade. I would love to bring it up. Let's to see. A yeah, I think that's D. it, Liz. <gasps> yeah. I, I was going to do think... something with the snake thing, with the jaws, the jaws of Satan. <laughs> and sss, But I, I, it's just so interesting anyway. So I was like, you know what? We can just talk about this. <laughs> yeah, we can just talk about it too. That works too, Paul. Those were good. Yeah, so good, good little tidbits you found for this episode. Yeah, a lot of lot of Larry Cohen. You know, wrote a bunch of the stories, and he's such an interesting independent filmmaker. Um, it's interesting Kowalski, similar to him as well. But the, but Cohen was able to do, I think do more independent films than Kowalski and Kowalski was such a good TV director. You know, he's, he's, he, um, you know, was in demand for television. 
mm-hmm. compared to Cohen. I don't know if Cohen ever directed television, but yeah, Kowalski did Magnum PI, Simon and Simon. He might've been like a go-to pilot person, maybe mm-hmm. Beretta, um, Rockford files, Banachek streets of San Francisco. Very cool. All right, Paul, I guess we should wrap this up. Yeah. Thank you to Maxime Gervais for our theme song, Columbo. Yay. And this episode, this podcast is edited by John Warenas. Thank you, John. John. If you'd like to add to our conversation, share a smoke signal with us, you can email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail. Dot com, or you can find us on Instagram. We are at Trench Coat Cigar. We also have a Patreon if you'd like to show some support for our show. Just head to patreon.com slash Trench Coat Cigar. We have some exclusive videos and monthly updates over there. We also have a little merch in Redbubble if you'd like to order some fun stickers or tote bags or t-shirts you can go to redbubble.com and search for trench coat cigar and if you don't have any money right now which is totally fine just give our podcast a rating and or a review and that is a wonderful way to show support for our show or any show that you like listening to it really helps more listeners find us and paul one more thing yes liz Thanks for listening.